Hey friends, welcome to episode 484 of the My One Two Three Cents podcast. I am joined this week once again by Chad Smart, and we're going to be talking about Sting, his upcoming last match, and some folks who we think should have gotten that big, grandiose send-off. But before we get to all that, I do want to remind folks, because we are talking about Sting, we talked about Kevin McCleary last week losing his house in a fire and his son losing a lot of their, or all of their wrestling collectibles. They lost everything, essentially. But we're going to be raffling off a Sting t-shirt and this Sting figure and all you got to do is make a $5 donation, and then we're going to be using those funds for the month of February to purchase wrestling figures for Kevin's young son, who uh, is a big-time wrestling fan. Kevin, a big fan himself, uh, an indie wrestling referee. So uh, if you want a Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal, uh, all the details will be in the write-up for this week's podcast, as well as on the my one two three cents Facebook page. We're going to be doing the drawing, though. On Sunday, March 2nd, which is, or March 3rd, which is the night of Sting's last match with AEW. So again, a $5 donation gets you a, a chance into it, and it's all going to a good cause. Every month in 2024, we'll be raising money for the toy drive, the action figure drive that happens at the end of the year. January, the Royal Rumble, we raised 100 bucks already for the Royal Rumble contest, so we're going to keep that momentum moving throughout the rest of the year. All that being said, now Chad Smart is here. And Chad, Elimination Chamber is in the books, and we are more locked into the road to WrestleMania. We now know who Rhea Ripley will be defending her championship against, as well as Seth Rollins. Any surprises for you coming out of Elimination Chamber? Uh, Match-wise, no. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I found the show to be... The wrestling was was good you know i mean wwe has a talented roster so you got what you expected but i found the show overall to be quite kind of dull and i don't know if that was just hampered by waking up at 6 30 in the morning to watch the show since it aired since i didn't stay up until two in the morning to watch it live mm -hmm. but i also think you know when you have a show a three and a half hour show that has four five matches if you count the pre-show match you know it just that's a lot of time for not a lot mm -hmm. and, and especially throwing in the Grayson Waller effect um, talk show segment, which could have been a five minute segment on raw for as much as nothing was really accomplished in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, overall, I don't think the show was a must must see show, but uh like I said, it, it got us onto the road to WrestleMania. We, you know, I think we'd pulled over at a rest stop a couple weeks ago trying to figure out what was going on with Cody and, and Roman and The Rock. And I still don't know if that's fully uh, been decided, you know, as far as what they've presented to the audience. Right. So, Do you think uh, yeah. if Triple H would have said middle of the week that he was going to have a major announcement at Elimination Chamber that you would have enjoyed it more? Well, if he would take the Tony Khan approach to shows, yes. But I think he did mention that uh, it would be a big show or there'd be something memorable about the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing I could see that was memorable was, again, from, from an outsider looking at the show, at the presentation, it just looked like a venue that was not... Uh, would not be ideal for watching a elimination. Let me try that again. Watching an elimination chamber match because you know cage matches are already your view is blocked somewhat by the cage, right? And the elimination chamber is a much bigger cage with you know the four pods on the end. So I, you know, I don't know how it came off we did have friends that were there that i did message and ask them what it was like and they said they were in the 300 level of the arena and they were they spent most of the time watching the screens mm -hmm. but that they could see so yeah well you know it looked like a big venue obviously mm -hmm. a, a big setup for it and um you know the crowd yeah, and i believe like the cricket or the soccer fields are wider than our football stadiums where wrestlemania is held so mm -hmm. i think that added to maybe the the perspective of it being you know the seats being further away f from the room now i know you mentioned you know having to get up early and watching and you didn't obviously watch it live mm -hmm. um, 
I, I've seen a lot of criticism from some fans that, you know, are complaining that WWE has basically is living up to the world part of world wrestling entertainment. We saw it with AEW last year. And mm -hmm. of course, WWE has done some shows, SummerSlam 92, most memorable, I think, um, from international venues. And it seems like in 2024, they're going to Germany and uh, uh, France, France and a, a show in Canada. So they're obviously getting more of those international shows as well. I think it's awesome. I think it's a, a, a sign of the times and it, it's good uh, to get that international growth from, from all walks of life and all parts mm -hmm. of the world. And, you know, uh, I, so I don't mind. Getting, I did not get up early and, and watch, but uh, you know, I, I think had I lived on the east Co or the west coast like you do i may have stayed up and watched part of it but i don't think i could have stayed up and watched the whole thing so yeah um, i think it's cool yeah and part of not staying up other than the fact that i am old and i mean realizing that if i get home after 10 30 that i've stayed out too late <clears throat> is also like you know wwe shows tend to have a lot of filler in mm -hmm. terms right. of and you know one of the comments that i saw after the show was here's my take away from the elimination chamber promo go visit australia match go visit australia promo go visit australia you know it, and so I, that was part of my decision too is like i wanted to wait until the show was over so that i could fast forward through the oh, show yeah. and get through it quicker but yeah i do agree with you that um you know obviously wwe is doing more shows internationally as you said and i think it is a good thing because i think you know those crowds are eager for wrestling and you know as we saw with aew packing 70 000, 80 thousand however many they did into wembley elimination chambers fifty five thousand. when you have an audience that is that big that you know they're going to be into pretty much everything because they're like we want to show that it was a good decision to come over here that you know and and i think american audiences i mean we've had wrestling for the last 40 years, you know, big yep. shows. So you and even the cities that are, you know, hotbeds are kind of, I don't want to say burnt out, but like you really have to give them something good for them to get totally hyped. You know, we you know, know not the, there's no Mojo Rally City. Right. Well, we know with WrestleMania, you know, it becomes an international affair with fans from around the world coming here. I'd be curious to know how many fans, I'm sure there were some, mm -hmm went from the United States to Australia for the show. Maybe there were some, I don't know. I, I would, I would love to hear that. And, you know, I know that there were fans that traveled uh, from here to, for, to uh, Wembley for the AEW show last summer. And I'm sure that'll happen again this year. So uh, I, I, I'm curious if, if anyone listening or watching uh, knows someone who traveled or if you traveled, uh, make a comment and just let us know where you traveled from. Um, Cause I would imagine, I think it's what a 20 or 25 hour flight you get to, there having to to perth where they were probably because i think it's it was 16 15 16 to sydney and then mm -hmm. perth is all the way on the other side of so i don't yeah. know how you would get there i i didn't realize until our friend jackie had posted that she was traveling to perth from sydney mm -hmm. the distance between it's like a four and a half hour flight i think just within the country itself mm -hmm. so um I, I guess i never realized how big australia truly is and you've been to australia is that right I've been to Sydney, yes. Um, yeah, and I saw something that said Perth is the most isolated big city. Like the next nearest city is something like a thousand miles away or something like that. Wow. Yeah, because, I mean, Australia pretty much has just the coast. You know, oh. Sydney is on the east. Perth is more on the west. And then everything in the middle is just land that will kill you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Geography is over for the day. Now mm -hmm. we're going to talk some history and talk about Sting. Uh, and Chad, when when I first thought about doing this specific idea for the show, this was back when Sting first announced uh, in the fall that he was was going to retire, that his last match was going to be at AEW Revolution. Sting, I believe, is sixty three years old, sixty four years old, somewhere in that ballpark. What is your first memory? of Sting. When do you remember seeing him wrestle? And then I'm assuming you became a fan of his, but, but talk to me a little bit about your first time Sting memories. Yeah, I think, um, 
you know, my first memory, I guess the first conscious memory that I can recall would be Clash of the Champions 1. When really? Flair. However, I mean, I did watch Mid-South and I did see the Blade Runners, but I don't have a lot of, like I said, tangible memories of right. being like, oh, this is what Sting did in the UWF. It was more when, you know, they merged with Jim Crockett and, yeah. and started seeing him on TBS more often. So, yeah, because I can remember we would watch or I would watch UWF came on on Saturday mornings in, in St. Louis. Mm. And it would have probably been 86-ish. Um, he was being, Sting was being managed. I didn't, I have no recollection of the Blade Runners at all, but it was mm. uh, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert was managing uh, with Missy Hyatt. They were managing Sting and Rick Steiner. And Rick Steiner and Sting mm. were the tag team uh i think they may have been tag team champions in uwf and they feuded with chris adams and terry taylor and then they did like a double turn where terry taylor turned on chris adams and sting got turned on by hot stuff international and so yes he did yeah so sting ends up becoming the baby face and and i can remember like shane douglas an early young shane mm. douglas getting involved in that as well with sting but I, I personally always liked the uh, surfer sting mm -hmm. you know, from those early days in the, in the mid 80s. Um, I did not watch the first class of champions. I was actually at WrestleMania four on closed circuit watching it. Um, so I never saw. Well, I, later I saw it, but that day I did not see it. So did you watch that clash instead of, of WrestleMania that day? Yeah, because I believe. Yeah, WrestleMania four. So we had the our big satellite dish. Yeah. And we started watching WrestleMania four and they gave you like the first, I think we saw the battle Royal cause I'd opened the oh. show. And after that match was over, then they scrambled the signal. And oh, that was okay. when you needed a scrambler and we did not have one. And plus if we did, I don't think my parents would have ordered WrestleMania. So then, yeah, I remember after that was over, then I went over to my friend's house across the street and we watched clash of the champions. Gotcha. Okay. And so, really, a lot of people reference that as the match that kind of made Sting and and made him, because uh, like you said, he was doing stuff early on. I remember at Starcade, the first Starcade after Crockett bought the UWF. You know, Sting was in a six man tag with the Freebirds against uh, Larry Zabisco and and a couple of other. I don't even remember who the other two players were in that match, but it was, uh, you know opener or you know low on the card back before opening matches were were significant and meant something so um you know i i guess rick flair gets a lot of the credit mm -hmm. for helping to create and, and make sting and you have to often draw parallels between he and his former blade runner partner the ultimate warrior who went on to world class and then eventually the wwf and then their careers were almost parallel uh in 1990 when, when they both beat the top dogs, if you will, of the industry, Ric Flair in the NWA and, of course, Hulk Hogan in, in the WWF. Uh, but Sting, I feel like, hung on and, and stuck around. And, and, you know, here we are 34 years later. Mm -hmm. He's still in there. So mm -hmm. I often wonder what was different about Sting that made him stick around and stay. Because especially in the NWA, we didn't see those kind of gimmicked guys being at the top of the card. You know, it was Ric Flair, it was Dusty Rhodes, it was Harley Race, it was the uh, Four Horsemen, you know, the tough guy wrestler personas, if you will, and not so much the cartoony presentation of a Sting. So uh, I often wonder, too, what would have happened had Sting been the one to go to the WWF? Would he have gotten lost in the shuffle there, or would he have been on the same trajectory that he was? What do you think? Well, I think after WrestleMania 31, we have a pretty good idea of what would have happened to sting right um yeah i you know i think warrior got the push in wwe because he had the f physique mm -hmm. you know he was more of what vince mcmahon was pushing at that time yeah whereas i think sting is the better wrestler all around which fits more with what the nwa and wcw was about mm -hmm. yeah so yeah i think um you know i think going that direction was the best for both those guys you know if, if they'd gone the opposite direction and probably would not have worked out as well so 
Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I'm trying to think of what, I, th- I think it was just Sting's personality probably that helped get him over with the crowd. And then having Flair vouch for him and say, okay, we're going to make this guy a star because, you know, it, it, one of the things I think modern wrestling fans maybe don't appreciate as much or don't take into consideration is, you know, like I said, Sting and Flair wrestled that hour long, um, you know, Clash of the Champions draw match. Mm-hmm. But then Sting, you can correct me if I'm wrong, didn't win the title until, like I said, 1990, right? Two years later. Same way goes with, you know, Steve Austin coined Austin 316 in 96, King of the Ring 96, but didn't win the title until WrestleMania 98. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now we have people like, you know, with LA Knight being like, oh, he didn't win the title now. If he doesn't win it within the next two months, well, then, you know, yeah. it's over. You know, he's he's going to get buried and nothing's going to happen to him. And it's not the case. It's like sometimes you have to, you know, it, it's that final. And this is, I guess, where being a booker is hard part of do you strike while the iron's hot or do you let it cool maybe a little bit and then come back and make it a bigger victory? Yeah, no, I, I agree 100% with you on on that, but I do feel like, and and I, I one day I want to sit and do a, a more expansive episode on this topic. But it seems like it feels like the '90s, the early '90s specifically, the early mm-hmm. '90s definitively was a, a downturn for wrestling. But I almost feel like, in that, this is where I want to kind of do more uh, deeper dive and, and pop culture in general. I know back in the day when you were doing uh, your one hit wonders. Mm-hmm. Uh, podcast you know uh you talked about the year of 1991 and i feel like in wrestling as well there was that downturn because look at wwe's business wwf's business in in 88 89 90 hogan kind of takes some time off and time away the warrior is put in there but again as we talk deeper into this i feel like the warrior kind of got the raw end of the deal on that um, but the same with with WCW. I, it didn't feel like with Sting as the champion, you know, there was something different. And maybe because we had grown up with Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan mm-hmm. being the champions, and now there are two new guys at the same time. So there wasn't, you know, flipping the channel. You're you're getting new as well. So you're not nestled into that nostalgia, even though we were young at the time. But it just felt to me, it felt kind of weird. Uh, you know, Starcade 90, for example, you know, the main mm-hmm. event was Sting versus the Black Scorpion, which we know was Ric Flair. But, you know, even when he defended it at Halloween Havoc 90, you know, it was against Sid. So uh, it, it was, it took time, obviously, to build, like you said, those characters up. Uh, and eventually, you know, it made sense that Sting was the head of the card or the top of the card. Mm-hmm. You know, he's wrestling Vader. He's wrestling Rick Root. He's wrestling... Sid, he's wrestling all these uh, superstars because he is the top draw in the company or the top babyface in the company. So I think it just took some time. But that first year uh, of both of these guys kind of becoming champions of their respective companies, to me, it didn't feel, it felt less than Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. And I think that maybe it just took time to, to get through that. Now that's interesting. And now you got my head spinning and, and thinking about doing that deep dive so and i think you know part of it too is generational like you said you know um it's like it's like uh, i'll compare it to music since you know you brought up my podcast that i did which unfortunately is no longer online so if, if we whetted your appetite wanting to hear it too bad um but you know every six seven years i think you have turnover in pop culture because a generation that grew up with it is now either aging out or new acts are coming in. And as we've seen with wrestling, like you can't rely strictly on the past, you know, at some point you have to bring in new. And I think, you know, the early two thousands is a prime example of WWE waiting too long to try to make new stars and all their old stars have, you know, with Austin's injuries, with the rock leaving for Hollywood, with Foley retiring, like, they just, they didn't have anybody ready to go. You know, they were, I mean, Randy Orton and Batista were coming up, but still it, it takes time. You know, you can't just throw someone in there. And so 
Um, yeah, I guess with 91, yeah, there would have been a lot of changes and especially in WCW. And I'm trying to remember when, I mean, you know, Flair would have been fired in 91 mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and I think when you have a champion that leaves and, you know, I'll say this now for AEW currently at the moment, you know, MJF lost the titles to Samoa Joe at the end of, of last year. And we haven't seen MJF in the last two months. And I feel like part of that has hampered Samoa Joe's run because, you know, you're like, oh, you beat a guy and then he just disappears. And so it kind of seems like a lame duck victory. And mm-hmm. so, especially, you know, going back to WCW when Flair had left and they did the Barry Windham, was it Barry Windham Lex Luger match? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the crowd wasn't going to buy whoever won it because, you know, it, I mean, it's like Rocky V. It's like, well, Rocky's retired. Tommy Gunn wins the title. And, and the crowd's just like, no, you're a paper champion because you haven't beat anybody. Yeah. So, and, you know, with Sting, we, we mm-hmm. talked about um, that mainstay and, and being, you know, I think they had referred to him at one point as the franchise of WCW, one of the very few people to not defect during the Monday Night War. Mm-hmm. But he was also one of those guys who, like Triple H, like Kane, like The Undertaker, even gold dust I'll throw into this category where those guys had long runs um, and they didn't necessarily change. You know, it wasn't like a, an IRS, Mike Rotundo, uh, you know, kind of mm-hmm. Michael Wall Street, th- those kinds of people, but more of uh, staying that same character, but being able to evolve and change it. And I think Sting may be, you know, the king of that evolution and, and keeping things fresh and, and evolving uh with the times and with the character going from, you know, that bright neon face paint and, and bleach blonde spiked hair to letting it grow out and becoming the crow sting, which I think a lot of people really truly. And here he is again, as the crow. Mm-hmm. Thanks again for sending us over Chad. Uh, a lot of people really embraced and liked that character. Um, and, you know, I know he evolved it and, and changed it up a little bit. And, and when he was, joker sting and tna for a minute and yeah. always kind of though it seems like he falls back to that crowish character which he is still today but obviously have changed things up but to be in the business for 40 years essentially with the same name and same character just kind of making those tweaks to it uh, mm-hmm. says a lot i think about sting or or steve borden the man behind the character who didn't get stale didn't get old didn't get uh, outdated and I know there was some time there that he wasn't wrestling, but uh, really a credit to him and, and that that ability to adapt and change. Did you have a, a preference to beach or uh, I say beach bumps Surfer sting. Surfer sting to to the crow sting or, uh, you know, I, I think we can all agree the tomato face sting was probably our least favorite. Yeah, that one. You know, I I'll be honest, I don't like the crow sting. Yeah, I've, ne- I've never liked the design of the makeup, and maybe it's because I, I wasn't a big fan of the Crow the yeah. movie, so it just didn't resonate with me. And Surfer Sting being the original, yeah, you know, maybe that's why I liked it more. But um, yeah, I mean, Sting, like you said, has done well for reinventing. And you know, after his WWE run, which we thought was oh, you know, the end of it, right? We were there when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, and he laid the bat down and said, I retire for him to come back and do the stuff that he has done in in AEW is uh, on one hand, amazing. And on the other hand, stupid because he takes a lot of risks that, you know, you and I, like you said, he's 63. You and I are 50 ish. And uh, I'm not going to go do half the stuff this thing is doing. Uh, I mean, getting off my couch in the morning is, you know, enough of a, of a physical activity sometimes, but yeah, I, and I think, I don't know. It's, it's just something about, like you said, the fact that he's never changed character or gimmick. And again, right. I guess this goes into gimmick versus yeah. character, which is the thing. He's never changed the gimmick. He's just changed the character a little bit and he's tweaked it to keep it somewhat fresh. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, like I said, I I would prefer the look of Surfer Sting. And I know he has said that he doesn't have the hair. He can't pull off the flat top anymore. Yeah. Um, but 
it would be, you know, with his upcoming last match, I think it would be interesting if he did a half crow, half surfer makeup mm-hmm. style. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, that would that would be cool. My original idea was uh, that I talked about when Sting first announced it mm-hmm. was that it be a cinematic match where it starts off as him as the crow, and then eventually he ends up in the ring as as uh, Surfer Sting because mm-hmm. you cut you couldn't go back and forth with the hair and, and whatnot. But yeah, um, it, it is an interesting. It has been an interesting road. I'm curious uh, your thoughts on this because you know I'm obviously uh, a bigger WWE guy than AEW, and I think you're bigger AEW than WWE. I don't look at WWE as necessarily fumbling Sting's career while he was there. I know he got hurt. And again, you can, you know, whether you blame Seth Rollins for that or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm glad though that Sting is getting an opportunity to have a proper send off and, and get a final match. Um, some would argue maybe he stuck around too long. Uh, you know, back in the day, could you have imagined a, a 63 year old hmm. Pedro Morales coming back to the WWF and, and, you know, winning the tag team titles uh, with a, a younger partner. You know, I, I think it, it, it requires a special talent. You can't do that with everyone. Um, and Sting is obviously one of those few in a generation talents that, that could pull something like that off and give that rub and, and pass that torch. And I think that they've done a good job with that. I think if this were just Sting alone, doing all of this i think fans may have a different perception of it but i think the fact that he's not necessarily hogged the spotlight with all of this and it has been more of a let's build up darby allen let's build Mm -hmm. up maybe help the the young bucks uh you know get up they're already over and and where they need to be but you know i i think that that this has been uh a, a good template if you will in in how to send off a legend in in proper fashion yeah and i you know there are reports that he didn't want to win the aew tag team titles and i don't think they needed to win them and i'm curious i mean we'll see how the story plays out because you know normally you would think okay last match he's going to do the honor he's going to put the young bucks over who again the young bucks don't need to be put over um but I'm curious to see where that story goes. And I think, yeah, like you said, it's not, even though Sting is undefeated in AEW, the fact that he's never in the title picture, I think helps because it's more about building and and, and looking over his match results, you know, it's like, okay, who could have beat him? And he's never really, I think there's only been like maybe two matches, two or three matches where he's been against someone who you thought, okay, beating sting would have been the better decision or, you know, would have helped. It's, it's been a lot of mid mid card guys. And Did he have any singles matches in AEW? Nothing I, I can recall. I yeah. think it's all been, and that's the other thing is, yeah, he's there. Darby is the star yeah. sting is the, you know, the backup if need be, but he's not like the backup that has to come in and get the win for Darby. It's just, you know, they're, uh, AEW is very big on groups and yeah, actually, so he's just there to help when the feud requires it or when the story. So we got to talk about Ric Flair. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we were there for Flair's alleged last match at mm-hmm. WrestleMania 24. Gosh, 16 years ago now. Can you believe that? Um, Flair and Sting obviously have a very storied past. We talked earlier about the Clash match. Uh, they're in the same building that that match happened. Flair and Sting had the last match on Nitro. Uh, you know, it, Flair and Sting are, are probably, I would say Flair is, is Sting's greatest rival. Um, and Sting is one of Flair's greatest rivals. So on one hand, you have the ending of this match, Sting and Darby Allen win, and Ric Flair's in the middle of the ring holding up their arms, celebrating. To me, that's... Uh, you know, one of those moments, you know, 20 years from now, we'll look back at that picture like we look at the Benoit, well, <laughs> example, but you know what I mean, like those iconic, you know, Hulk Hogan mm-hmm. body climbing under the giant and, you know, those fun celebration moments. That's one hand. But on the other hand, it's Sting and Ric Flair. You would expect there to be a turn, and I think they planted a seed 
last week on Dynamite mm -hmm. that that may be coming. And I know we're less than a week away now from the match happening. So do you, what are your thoughts? Should Sting and Flair be al allies in this, or does it make more sense from a, uh, you know, storyline perspective with the history between these two that they're uh, mortal enemies once again? You know, it's interesting. And this is, I guess, one of those cases where you got to let the story play out to see mm -hmm. how it happens. But I think it is interesting that, um, that they are going with the tease of Flair possibly caught, you know, turning on Sting or being upset with Sting yeah. because, you know, when Flair showed up at Dynamite last week, he was like, you know, I thought I would be a bigger part of this celebration. And, and which is like, something I could see Ric Flair legitimately being pissed I mean, about. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was a shoot. So that wasn't part of the promo. Um, but, you know, telegraphing it that way, like having him go in and talk to the young bucks who are, playing up their new, you know, EVP characters. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's like, okay, is it too, is it not subtle enough? Is it, you know, cause I remember when um, Sting and Flair teamed up, take on uh, Arn Anderson and Brian Pillman when the horsemen, you know, reunited. And that one was, I mean, that one got me where I wasn't expecting yeah. Flair to turn. And then when he did, you're like, oh yeah. I mean, that's Flair. It's what he does. It's right. Yes. Um, so I don't, you know, part of me says, yes, Flair needs to turn one last time just to, you know, because that's a little legacy. That's what you want to see. But is this going to be a, a double turn where Flair's teasing turning, but then actually he help, turns to help Sting and he turns on the young box? You know, I don't, I don't know. But I, I do think I will just say that having Flair there, um, is is a good thing i you know i think and i would hope and i don't know what their plans are but it would be nice to see you know lex luger there and um i don't know if you want to bring in nikita koloff or you know guys from sting's path you know um i know kevin nash has said he can't be there due to his wwe legends deal which seems kind of odd but um but yeah i, I would i would no. I question that one when he said, yeah. that, but, you know, so, so we'll see. And, I, you know, I think it's, I am looking forward to the match. I'm looking forward to the show. I think they've done a good job of building the interest and the fact that, it, that they've come out and said, it's going to be Sting's last match helps, you know, Oh yeah. and they've been building it for three months instead of just ha having the match and then having him come out on dynamite the next night and, and be like, Oh, I'm retired. You know, kind of like what edge did after WrestleMania 27, where, yeah you didn't know going in. So you have the, the buildup to it. So the fans can really, I think, appreciate it more. Absolutely. And I think that with, um, you know, the flair thing being kind of that question mark still, because the, and again, read it online. So it's gotta be, <laughs> true, right. Uh, he has a two year deal with AEW yeah. to promote the sport or the, uh, energy drink and, and all that. So does he continue on and, and manage Darby Allen if he doesn't turn mm -hmm. on Sting or does he go on to, to manage the, but like, I'm curious what happens with flair. And I mean, I know Sting has said he's not wrestling anymore, but is he like walking away? Is he done done mm -hmm. or will he come back from time to time? And that's kind of the other thing I wanted to talk about with you on, on these other legends who could have, should have, would have had a great, last match and a great send-off, you know, uh, just because you have that last match doesn't mean then you're completely absolved from from the business. Could we see Sting go back at some point to WWE in some sort of capacity? You know, I, I don't know. And I, I'm curious, uh, you know, kind of what you think, because I think guys like Kurt Angle, you know, he came back to WWE after leaving TNA, had his last match against Baron Corbin. I was disappointed in that. I did not like because it felt like they didn't do anything with Baron Corbin afterward. Um, he was really before. I don't think he was in right. He was mid before, and he he was mid after, and probably even and less than mid. Uh, I I think he may have become worse talent wise at or perception wise than he was before that match with Kurt Angle. So you expected there to be more, and I think you know Shawn Michaels obviously didn't need to beat Ric Flair, but it was a great story. It made mm -hmm. sense. Um, 
you know, and I'm trying to think of some other instances where uh, a wrestler had their quote unquote last match. And, and, you know, the, the match that, that Flair came back and did in, in 2022, you know, with Jeff Jarrett and, and Andrade and, and Jay Lethal, obviously you had to put him in a, in a tag match. Cause I don't think mm-hmm. he would have been okay at his age and, and, and that long yeah. gap that he had before he had wrestled. Um, but do these legends deserve, I, I deserve, I don't want to use the word deserve, but do they need, uh, do fans, you know, does Mick Foley need to come back next year when he turns 60 to have that last hardcore match, which has been rumored to, you know, he's, he mentioned it on the last episode of his podcast. Do we need, or do we want to see that, you know, when a legend reaches a certain age and a certain level, should they come back? I mean, who are we to decide? I, I, you know, I, and I did a whole thing on age discrimination in the past and whatnot. So I'm, I'm conflicted, you know, does it need to happen? Probably not, but yeah, for the nostalgia pop, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing Mick Foley come back mm-hmm. one last time and, and have the send off maybe that, that he wanted. And that was kind of the, the Genesis idea for this podcast for this mm-hmm. episode. So what say you do these legends need to come back? Or do you have the desire to see them come back and and have a quote unquote last match? Yeah, it's a tough call because on one hand, yeah, you know, I do think it would be nice for these guys to get a proper send off. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if they're if it's going to be the end, again, kind of like what I said earlier with Sting, like let the crowd show their appreciation. Yeah. Um, or to use a phrase that I hate that it's apparently popular now, give them their flowers. You know, yeah. while they're still there. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, do the, you know, does a 60 year old, does a 70 year old guy need to come out of retirement to, to have it? Eh, probably not. I, I mean, unless, like I said, Sting is 63, you would not know it by watching him. Ric Flair, you like, oh, he's only 72. He was much older. He yeah. turned 75 today, I believe. Yeah, as we yeah. This. yeah. we're recording, it is his 75th birthday. So Yeah, you know, you're like, yeah, he doesn't look a day under 98. Um, but, and, and that's where, you know, with, with Mick Foley, you know, I don't know how long ago it's been since Foley's last match. And obviously he's not, he's not one that was ever a... Uh, great physical you know specimen right, um, right, right. and so yeah can i mean if mick wants to do it and again if if the if it's the wrestler themselves saying this is what i want to do and hopefully acknowledging their limitations and knowing what they can and can't do and it's done in a protective way to where all the necessary safety measures are in place then i say go for it because it's up to the you know, it's up to the wrestler. And if the audience doesn't want it, then you know what? The audience isn't going to be there. But I mean, I think Flair's match last match sold out and, you know, it was a big deal. Um, but is it something that we as fans want to watch or need to, I, again, that's, I guess that's up to personal, you know, personal opinion and personal. I mean, I, I did watch the Flair last match and, it's something match that I don't think I ever need to watch again. And I know, I think Flair has teased wanting another last match and you're like, no, I think we're good. Hopefully no one will be um, out of that. And to your point about Sting going to WWE after he leaves AEW, I know <clears throat> excuse me, AEW did put out a statement um, this past week saying, cause this dynamite coming up will be his last appearance on dynamite. He's like, but he may show up from time to time. You know, he may come back. And I think if they have a good story reason for him to be there, instead of just being like, hey, I'm Sting. I was in the neighborhood. I thought I'd stop by. You know, I, I can see Sting making an appearance and maybe either putting Darby over or giving, you know, giving Darby a pep talk at some point. Or if they bring someone new in that Sting wants to kind of, verbally give a rub to they could do that i don't i don't know if i ever see him going back to wwe i don't know what his you know relationship with triple h is who's now running things you know because i i am of the camp that the wrestlemania 31 match was 
bad for several reasons, not just because, you know, jobbing him out to Triple H, which just seemed like the one thing that he never, one reason why he never went to WWE was because they figured they wouldn't be used, but then having the NWO come out and it's like, wait, Sting and the NWO were not, I right. mean, yes, eventually with Wolfpack, whatever. And like you said, tomato face Sting, but yeah, I don't know if Sting even has that, you know, what his opinion of WWE is as a company, you know, by being loyal to WCW, was it because he's like, hey, yeah, WWE is not what I, the wrestling that I want to do. I don't know. You know, it's, that's hard for me to speculate because not knowing. Who are, you know, because obviously we know it's going to be, and I keep saying uh, so-called or alleged, but, you know, I, I do think Sting will probably be done after this. I don't I don't think he'll make a comeback, but he may. But, you know, Kurt Angle has stayed retired. Shawn Michaels, for the most part, I know he came back and did that match at uh, in Saudi Arabia a couple mm-hmm. years ago with the Brothers of Destruction and, and, and uh, Triple H. Uh, but, it, you know, when we know it's going to be someone's last time, you know, like Hulk Hogan, we didn't know it was his last match. Mick Foley, mm-hmm. for example. Um, Macho Man Randy Savage. Those are some guys that had a last match, but we didn't know at the time that it was their last match. Like, I think Hulk Hogan's last match was something in TNA, and, and you know, it was a part mm-hmm. of a tag team thing. Um, Randy Savage, I think, was that spot, that appearance he made at TNA. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many talents out there that I wish we could have seen, you know, and celebrate. And obviously though, you can't do them all. It's like the hall of fame. Not everybody can go in the hall of fame. And I don't think everybody can have that grand send off, but yeah, there are a handful. And I wanted to talk about a few of those and and get your thoughts and opinions. So did you have anyone on a list or, or that you thought, well, you know, it would have been nice for them to have that kind of send off that, that love that stings getting. And, And even when we were at WrestleMania 24, we didn't know Flair was for sure going to lose, but, the stipulation was if he lost, it was his last match. And the way they treated that weekend and, and the T-shirts and the things that were there, we knew Flair was going to lose. And so mm-hmm. to me, it was special. It felt special being there and, and being a part of that. And I do feel a little robbed of that when he went and wrestled in TNA uh, after that. But again, I get it. Wrestling retirements are not necessarily meant to last. We saw Ricky okay. Steamboat come back after like a 12 year hiatus or whatever it was when he first got hurt in WCW, mm-hmm. and, you know, edge came back. And so these other guys have come back, so it's not unheard of, uh, but it was there anyone that you thought maybe deserved a, a bit of a send off a grandiose exit from the business. You know, I was trying to think about it and I actually came up with more names that I want to see, mm-hmm. or I would love to see have a final match. So I never have to watch them again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Baron Corbin, Randy Orton. Um, oh, come but, on. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, thinking about it, you know, I the names that I came up with, and again, you never know because you never know when someone's going to come back for a one offer, you know, something. So it's hard to say. But, um, you know, given his, what has happened to him in the last 10, 15 years, whatever it's been, you know, I would have liked to seen Lex Luger yeah. have a final match and have, um, you know, and I, I, you know, and I don't know what his physicality is like right now, but he's someone that I would like to see maybe show up. Like I said, you know, at if he shows up at um, at Revolution, just for Sting's down. You know, I think it, they did a biography episode of him on the A and E biography yeah. recently, and you know, for everything that he has gone through, I think he's just a good example of staying positive. Yeah. And, you know, I think I would like to see that kind of be rewarded and kind of shown out there to be, you know, kind of a testament to life after wrestling, I guess. But I I think um, I I really think that they will work him him and, like you said, some of the horsemen. And mm -hmm. I think it'll be similar to what we saw with Flair um, that night. I I, I I, think that. Yeah. And I wonder if it'll be on camera or like it was for right. you know yeah. flair's final send off where after the show's over they'll do something for the mm-hmm. audience and yeah. 
Um, and I really wish the show would have been on a Saturday because then you and I would have been there because I would have made you go. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think other other guys. And I think, you know, part of it is to like, like you said, the names that we lost too soon or sooner than we expected, like Macho, Piper, Dusty, you know, guys that never got a proper send off. But then also look at it like, do these guys, would these guys want to call it quits, you know, right. or say like, okay, this is it. This is, and I think that, you know, cause I talking about flair, this, I don't think flair can walk away from wrestling. I think it's so ingrained into who he is and without it, what does he have? And yeah. so he need he needs, it's, sadly, it's an addiction, I think. So, um, um, you know, I think Doink would have been a nice one to get a final send off. Uh, you know, it, it, you made a great point. You know, a lot of these talents, I don't know that they would have necessarily wanted it to be their last match. Dusty and, uh, you know, I, I do picture Hulk Hogan, you know, putting a bow on Hulkamania and wrapping things up. And I know that there were people that were freaking out because he had teased something for the Royal Rumble. And it turns out that he was just doing that intro thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think people thought I am a real American was going to hit and he was going to hit the <laughs> ring uh, and, and be a part of the 2024 Royal Rumble, which we obviously know did not happen. Uh, for me, I kind of went a little unconventional with one of my one of mine that I would have liked to have seen. And I don't know how you would have done it. But that would have been Bobby the Brain Heenan. And mm -hmm. maybe it's his last broadcast, and he kind of puts a bow on it. Uh, because a lot of times, yeah, we lose these legends to illness or, or you know, they, they pass away before they, like you said, get their flowers. And I know Heenan came back and did a couple of spots uh, with WWE after they bought WCW, but it was never quite the same. And I think also his health had started to deteriorate, and, and so we didn't necessarily get that but um you know rowdy piper and and those guys piper you know died at 60 or 61 62 he was young still you know young comparatively speaking to to the you know life expectancy of a, of a normal person so uh, i would have loved to have seen you know we, when we don't get that closure or get the chance to say goodbye or at least see you later uh you know, because we, we always knew Flair was going to come back in some form or fashion. You know, he always pops up mm -hmm. from, from time to time. And I hope that Sting does. You know, The Undertaker, we see him pop up from time to time still. And uh, so I like that. You know, even though they have their last match, there's still that ability to be a part of a show, to to come out and, and give someone else kind of that rub, so to speak. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember, I guess... Did Taker get a final, final match, or did he just kind of like? It was the Boneyard match with with AJ Styles. Styles, and then at Survivor Series during the yeah during the pandemic, they're like, we're going to celebrate. Yeah, that was it, you know, for him. And I, I do think though, with with the Undertaker, I'm not saying that he doesn't deserve more, but mm -hmm. I think that really he got some redemption, if you will, uh, for the Hall of Fame. You know, he had that whole ring to himself and w spoke for a long time. And, you know, I, I feel like that kind of became his closure. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, and who's to say he doesn't come back and have a match, but speaking of the undertaker, you know, for years, it was the, the talk of, of sting versus the undertaker at WrestleMania. We never got that match. Obviously should that been a, uh, should that have been a match that we got? And I think, you know, had sting jumped, to WWE early on instead of going to TNA, I think we would have eventually gotten it. And it when it would have been a better match than, you know, in 2014 when Sting finally comes over at that year's Survivor Series, I, I don't think it would have been the same, uh, you know, in the in the 20 teens as it would have been in the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, capability-wise. But, yeah, yeah I th you know, and I think – Part of me would say it's better that we never got the match because I think that match has been hyped by fans winning it so much that it couldn't live up to expectations. So it's better to have the what if in this situation too, because then the fans can look at themselves and be satisfied with what happened. And, yeah. and again, I'm, you know, maybe being cynical, 
shocker, but uh, seeing his match with Triple H and how that went down, I, I you know I don't know if I have the faith in WWE booking to have book to have made Sting look right credible against the Undertaker. I'm not saying Sting needed to win necessarily, but you know would he have been treated like like a top star coming over or would he have been put in polka dots and, you know, told to dance around? Very good. Very true. Uh, anything else on your mind before we wrap up this week's episode? You know, I was just trying to think, um, cause I went to AEW full gear back in November of 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just saying that in case someone's listening to this in 2026 or 27 to give them reference, but and I saw, you know, Sting team with Darby and Adam Copeland. And I was thinking, like, is this the first time that I've seen Sting Russell? Because my first WCW match, pay-per-view was Starcade 95. Okay. Or 96, sorry. Which is when Sting right. was, you know, he came out to help at the end of the match, but he never wrestled. He re- wasn't at sold out 97. Great American Bash 97, he wasn't. And I was like... I don't think I, and then I'm going back over the shows that I've seen. I'm like, oh, wait, the la- the first Nitro that I went to, or la- only Nitro, which was May of 2000 in St. Louis, the night after David Arquette lost the title at Slam Slamboree, Sting wrestled Jeff Jarrett oh. in the main event. And then the first TNA anniversary show, Sting team with AJ Styles. I'm like, yeah, I guess those matches really weren't that uh, memorable to have a lasting impression of. But, but you know, you've said you never got to see Andre the Giant wrestle. And Sting is like the guy, I guess, who is the biggest star that I've only seen, you know, a, a few times, but nothing nothing really memorable. So, yeah. Well, now, now that, that, yeah, now that you mention it, I guess the only time I've seen Sting wrestle live was Starcade 90 when he mm-hmm. wrestled uh, the Black Scorpion in, in St. Louis. So. Yeah. And then we saw his Hall of Fame induction into right. WWE, yeah. which is, yeah. Which I think the guy behind us is still upset that Snoop Dogg went on before Sting and Sting, he had to wait three hours for Sting to come out. Yes. Oh, man, the memories. We're going to be talking about our WrestleMania memories coming up on a future episode of the podcast. It is WrestleMania season. We'll be talking Hall of Fame and WrestleMania and all the good stuff in between. Uh, We'll get those on the books here very soon. But again, we want to remind you to check out that auction that's going on, a raffle, if you will. Uh, $5 gets you in, and uh, the proceeds go to the My123 Cents action figure drive. This month, though, we are focusing on uh, Kevin McCleary and his family and making a small donation to them uh, based on what is given. And if you have some uh, figures laying around that you want to donate that are out of the package. You know, he's taking uh, any kind of toys that he can get for his son. So again, hit us up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or X, uh, of course, YouTube and TikTok as well. And uh, Chad, anything else before we say goodbye on this week's episode? Um, I, no, I think, I mean, I, I, I I've been on the show three weeks in a row now. I, I feel like um, I should get a uh, official title for, you know, I, I'm obviously not the co-host of the year, but I should be uh, co-host of the moment. And you'd be close. You'd be close. <laughs> we'll, we'll work up something. I, I do have a, a show coming up where uh, we'll be talking with um, uh, Vinnie Berry who is the author of a new book about Black Bart. He sent me a copy of that. So we'll be talking with him very soon as well here on the show. But yeah, Chad, we're going to be talking WrestleMania, WrestleMania season, the 10 WrestleManias that we've been to. I'm excited uh, about those conversations coming up uh, in the month of March for sure. All right. Sounds good. Awesome. Friends, thank you so much for listening and or watching this week's podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and let us know your one, two, three cents about our one, two, three cents. Have a great week.